Erev Tov Chabrim, I'm Stephen Benoon, and you're watching Israeli News Live. We are coming back again to update you on the uh, attacks in Belgium, as we've titled this, Belgium Attacks Calls for a Global Response. Uh, the global response is something French President Franco uh, Holland made the reference to today. And uh, uh, we're actually going to be looking even deeper into this on this segment here, looking at some uh, prophetic implications uh, that go along with the Syrian refugee crisis. Uh, one of the reasons, no doubt, why the, the, the situation here in uh, Europe is escalating, the violence is escalating. ISIS has claimed responsibility for this attack already, and uh, we want to be able to um, take a look at some of the implications in behind this uh, from a prophetic standpoint as well. Before we get into that, though, let's take a look and kind of capture, uh, look at some of the things here that have, that have taken place. Uh, this particular video footage I'm going to share with you here mo momentarily was from the scenes on RT News from within inside uh, right after the bomb blast went off inside the airport. Take a, take a look at this here and uh, I want you to be able to hear just the, the sad sounds of cries in there. As you can see, the strollers uh, also there. Uh, some of the video we were able to see where, where families were able to grab the children and run and some of the footage that is aired today. Uh, not everyone's so lucky. As of right now, the death toll is at 34. Uh, we know that 20 people have died from the uh, subway attack there and approximately, uh, I believe it's 14 that have been uh, killed in the airport itself. Uh, it's very, very tragic indeed for Belgium today. Um, and of course, uh, just, you know, you just cannot even imagine just how bad this has been. Um, we, this here is a photograph that we took ourselves only, uh, I guess, two or three weeks ago when we were in Belgium. And the security forces that are in Belgium are definitely on a state of high alert already, even in light of the recent arrests that were made of uh, potential terrorists and their activities in Belgium, expecting that there was going to be uh, an attack of this sort here coming in the very near future. Uh, this is outside the Russian and U.S. embassies uh, in Belgium. And, uh, uh, and right across the street from the embassy here where we took this photograph ourselves, uh, is where the metro station is, uh, directly across the street, uh, maybe a block or so off, I believe, uh, from the actual uh, American embassy. And it makes you wonder if the uh, terrorists were trying to hit more of an American interest in light of this. I say this because the, it, the blast went off near American Airlines, and of course the subway was attacked on the uh, section uh, leading to the U.S. Embassy. Of course, Russian Embassy there as well. They could have done this in light of both embassies being side by side, uh, but it just kind of makes you wonder a little bit here. This is some footage also that was uh, shown on RT today, earlier today, uh, and this is around the subway itself. Um, the attack that happened there, you can see the individuals on the sidewalk there. They are, they're uh, doing uh, first responding uh, on these individuals here that were uh, hit in this attack there uh, in Belgium. A uh, very tragic situation uh, for the people of Belgium. And of course, our condolences uh, go out to those loved ones uh, uh, or those that have lost their loved ones in this attack. And, and definitely there needs to be a solidarity of pr prayer for people uh, that, that have just been devastated by this. Uh, I didn't actually put the photo on here, but right around the corner from this as well is the European Commission building, a very huge uh, building there. We've actually got a photo of that uh, as well when we were there. Um, the, uh, so one of the men in the European Commission there was really upset because he said there were no police coming to the scene of the European Commission building uh, to secure it after the bombing being so close there. Uh, so they were a little bit surprised about that. But uh, I think you got to take into consideration uh, this was a major uh, attack for uh, 
Belgium, and no doubt they realized that the, the, uh, the places that were being hit were those of transportation. Uh, eyewitnesses and world leaders react to horrific attacks in Belgium's capital. This was on news.com.au. Uh, today, on March 22nd, French President Francois Hollande has called for a blunt response to the terrorist attacks in Brussels, believed to have killed at least 34 people, showing the same uh, stoicism he showed after Paris was so uh, callously attacked last November. Holland reaffirmed his dedication to defeating terrorism at all costs. Terrorists struck Brussels, but it was Europe that was targeted and all the world that is concerned, Holland said. We are facing a global threat which requires a global response. France and Belgium are linked by the horror we have shared, uh, not only that, but also by borders. In fact, uh, Calais, uh, the uh, French city, is right there near the border of Belgium, not far, only with, well, gosh, I'd say about an hour and a half, two hours from the capital of Belgium is Calais, France, where such a huge crisis uh, problem there is going on. Also, President Barack Obama from Cuba, where he is right now, Stated on CNN, Obama on terror attacks, we stand in solidarity with Belgium. CNN, the U.S. will do whatever it can help Belgium bring to justice those responsible for Tuesday's terror attacks, President Barack Obama declared Tuesday. Obama urged international unity in the fight against terror after the attack left at least 34 people dead. Uh, again, as I stated before, the amount of security there in Belgium is definitely not lacking whatsoever. Uh, here at a mall, when we had stopped at a mall there, uh, when we were uh, there that evening there, we, we saw many scenes like this one here where you see the two soldiers here, military soldiers. And what's kind of interesting, if you look closely at the picture, there are two Arab guys there. And by the way, there are a huge number of Arabs in the capital of Belgium. There is a refugee center. Our hotel was right around the corner from that refugee center there. Uh, and it's made a lot of people uneasy. A lot of people are nervous. Uh, I, I would assume the majority of the Arab uh, population there are, are not violent. Uh, but nonetheless, there is that small percentage that there is a terror threat. Uh, but in this particular picture, it's very interesting because one of the uh, Arab guys is looking directly at me, watching me do the photograph. The other one is, uh, that's with him there is looking down at the weapon of the soldier itself. What is going through the mind of people that are thinking like that? It's just really beyond me there. Uh, these all were the two suspects that the CT, uh, CTV uh, footage was able to capture. Uh, and of course, they were asking for the public's help in trying to identify them. This was on, uh, uh, on The Guardian. And it says, Brussels explosion of ISIS claims airport and metro attacks. Live update, Islamic State ISIS claimed responsibility for the attacks according to the news agency affiliated to the group. Uh, that was published there. And, uh, but let me just say this, though. I cannot help but believe, in light of this, especially when you begin to see, as the U.S. has said, uh, being in solidarity with Europe and what they're going through, with what uh, President Franco uh, Holland has stated there, uh, that this uh, needs a global response. This is the perfect opportunity uh, for Europe to be able to justify to put boots on the ground. Now, there's no doubt there's definitely going to be with conspiracy theorists, there's, there's coming immediately, if it hasn't already begun, people are going to say it's an inside job, that it is something that the governments of Europe have done intentionally to justify boots on the ground in Syria. Uh, I, I can't say that that's so. I was there in uh, France and one thing's for sure, it's not actors, as some people suggest that the, you know, there's really nothing happening. That's a bunch of garbage. I seen the bullet, uh, bullets ridden uh, into the tree uh, that was right there in front of one of the restaurants there. A uh, very large caliber weapon that was being used. People definitely are dying and being killed in this. This is not a conspiracy theory. But does it uh, create a sense of urgency on these nations to be able to justify and go in and hit Syria? Uh, yes, they will use that. And they're definitely going to take advantage, especially in light that Russia, quote unquote, has pulled out of Syria. But Russia never has fully pulled out. And they know that. But Russia did remove a large number of its uh, aircraft 
back into their homeland, and I personally believe that was to beef up their own security back home in light of the, uh, the NATO war games that were going on out of Norway. Um, even though it is an annual event, it was very huge compared to most years this year. Uh, and there is a lot of tension between uh, the two countries. And so Russia, no doubt, went up there to protect their own border, but they do have two bases there. This was on the Observer, March 22nd, 2016. Is Russia really pulling out from Syria uh, in yet? Not yet, in other words. Putin is keeping a total control of the Russian port in Tardis, its naval headquarters in the Mediterranean and the, <clears throat> the Middle East. From Tardis, Russia can listen in on control all their assets and their forces as they roam throughout the region. They can listen to almost everything that happens with everyone else throughout the entire Middle East. Um, Tardis is a huge strategic asset for Russia. Creating the port was one of Putin's major goals from the very beginning of the Syria, uh, opera Syrian operations. Now, on the same article here, though, very interesting thing, and I want you to pay attention to this. We get near the end of this. I put it in yellow. Putin will also be keeping the newly Russian-built Air Force bases in Latvia and uh, Himayim, excuse me, Him Him uh, Each of these bases houses dozens of fighters. When you add those jets uh, to the 30 to 40 jets on the Russian aircraft carrier, which is off the coast of Tardis, uh, the number of Russian fighter jets around Syria reaches to about 70 to 75. Ultimately, Putin has been keeping Bashar Assad of Syria in power. With Assad in power, Putin could build Russian infrastructure. Russia does not feel that Assad on his own has the power to stay. But they need him in place and they will keep him there until a better situation emerges. That better situation may very likely be splitting of the country into cantons or federations. Canton for the Kurds. Now watch, watch who all gets part of this land. Kurds, the Alwites, which is Assad's clan. A canton for Hezbollah on the Golan Heights. And a canton for the Sunnis. Hezbollah is actually going to be given territory for themselves. I mean, this is utterly insane to think of that Russia would, or not even just Russia, uh, you know, to begin with, Russia is really not the main one getting to do the negotiations. This is the United States doing the negotiations here. They're the ones that are controlling it. You know, we were there, and I could easily share this with you. I've never done it as of yet, but we were there in a hotel in uh, Geneva, when the talks first began, and ironically, we ended up in the hotel where some of the Syrian rebels were staying at for the negotiations there, and we saw the American delegation there with them in the restaurant and the hotel as they were talking and discussing what to do in this negotiations. My family sat down beside one of those terrorists uh, because I consider if you're, if you're a rebel fighting against Assad, it's still terrorism. Um, because we have seen what they have done, to say the least. But to see that Hezbollah is actually going to get land on the Golan Heights there, this is really, really insane. Uh, anyway, let me explain to you why this is insane. If you look at Nasrallah, who's just threatened to bomb the chemical facility and kill thousands of Israelis, that's the title of the Times of Israel's article on February 16th of 2016, States here, Israel's psychological warfare is no use against us. This is what Nasrallah stated. He said in a speech that was broadcast by the Lebanese Naharent news site. As an example, Nasrallah said Israel feared the groups of cache of rockets capable of striking the ammonia facilities in Haifa. An attack that he said would result in casualties equivalent to those that would be caused by a nuclear attack. So he's definitely going to go for it, isn't he? He's also threatened again here recently to, uh, to attack the nuclear uh, power facility in Israel down by Jerusalem. So this is definitely not a good situation at all. And a note I made here myself, it may be that while Russia has temporary pullback, that NATO members are taking advantage of the situation to get boots on the ground. Building public support is a must in a democracy. And that's what you do have to understand. They... It takes a situation like this to get democratic governments, get the people in behind 
doing an attack such as what they're going to do. Now, as I said to you, I wanted to look at some of the biblical and spiritual ramifications for the situation that's going on in Syria and really begin to break it down so you can see why this has happened, what the result has caused from it, and, and, and to continue from there. All right, if we go to the book of Nahum, who has prophesied of the modern day events today that we're looking at. And by the way, you're going to be shocked at some of the prophecies you're going to look at tonight here on Israeli News Live. We are definitely looking at prophecies that are being fulfilled. Even some of these I've already said to you, many of them I have, but I'm going to share with you some insights that I have not shared with you thus far. Uh, Nahum chapter 3 verse 18 says, Thy shepherd slumber, O king of Assyria, thy noble shall dwell in the dust, thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. That's interesting, isn't it? Notice when he says no man gathers them. 38 states in the United States of America have rejected any form of refugees, Syrian refugees coming to them. Many of the Europeans, especially the people in these nations, it doesn't matter if Germany, if Merkel opened her border, or if uh, the UK is allowing refugees to come in there, the European people, period, are protesting like crazy and do not want refugees in their country, period, all right? And the Arab nations don't even want these refugees. So when you look at the scripture here where it says, Thy shepherd slumber, O king of Assyria, thy noble shall dwell in the dust. Thy people is scattered upon the mountains, and no man gathereth them. They're just wandering aimlessly. Now watch what Nahum says in verse 19. There is no healing of thy bruise. Thy wound is grievous. All that hear the brute of thee shall clap the hands over thee, for upon whom hath not thy wickedness passed continually. All right, now we're talking about Assyria. All right. Now, some people say, well, this is just Syria. No, the, the kingdom of Assyria encompassed what we call today modern Syria as well as the northwest section of Iraq. And this is what's funny. It's not just Syrian refugees, but the refugees are also coming from places like Mosul, uh, Nineveh, places out of northwestern Iraq, where it's a, a huge Kurdish population. And so, yes, th this is what's exactly happening. And, and the people are not, they're not going to be gathered again. They are, they are displaced permanently. So don't think that the Syrians are going home. They're not. I know that there's been some talk, we're going to send them back. Send them back to what? Their, their country is devastated. All right? Now, Micah sees how this actually happens, all right? Now, in the photograph you see here, you literally have ISIS members there. They're on the border of Turkey there, and they're, they have captured the fleeing refugees, and they're ordering them to do what they want them to do. Watch what Micah says. And that day also he shall come even to thee from Assyria, and from the fortified cities, and from the fortress even to the river, and from sea to sea, and from mountain to mountain. Notwithstanding, the land shall be desolate because of them that dwell therein, for the fruit of their doings. You see, the United States, we already know this, along with some of its allies, they were training at secret bases in Jordan, these ISIS militants, Several, quite a few years back now. They created this whole quagmire of a mess in Syria. But the funny thing is, you're going to find out it's fulfilling prophecy, not just this prophecy here that they don't never return home, not just the fact that the prophecy of Micah 7.13 says they do it of the fruit of their own doings. The civil war and the strife within the country, it's their own doings that they're causing the land to be desolate, right? So, so it's regardless of who created this group here and armed them to do it, they're, they're causing their own problem. And as we saw in Nahum, they're not going to be returned. No man gathereth them. They're in permanent exile, friends. Now, let's move on. Obadiah. You have to kind of back up. I've, I've spoke about this many times. It's the first time I put it all together in one prophecy here. 
Watch what we look here. Obadiah chapter 1, verse 6. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? Now, a lot of people don't realize Esau is prophetically spoken of. He has always hated his brother Jacob. And you're going to find out now that Esau is the Roman Empire of today, of the Vatican itself. That is Esau's descendants. All right? Watch what he says here. How are the things of Esau searched out? How are his hidden things sought up? How, in other words, how do you know who Esau really is? That's what, the, that's what it comes down to, the prophecy here. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is none understanding in him. Now, Two things I want you to notice in here. One, they eat bread with you, and they put a wound under him. All right? They eat thy bread and have laid a wound under thee. Everybody looks for the Antichrist to have a deadly wound. There's your wound right there. Esau is the one that is wounded. All right? The bread is the communion. That The Catholic Church is world known all over the world for giving of the bread. So they eat your bread. In other words, the Vatican is over the entire world. We already know this. They have the two keys on their flag. They represent, they, they, they rule both spiritually and political powers of the world. I've been in Rome. I've heard their very people state that from their own official dialogue that that's what the two keys represent. So I know it for a fact. All right. Now, not only that, but the Bible says in the, in the Christian Bible that they that they uh, that they that they're the multitude there they they dwell on the waters many waters there and that is the multitudes and nations because why she is the mystery Babylon of Revelation I believe that's chapter either 16 or 17 all right now so she's wounded and she's also they eat her bread there's your communion there's your wound of the mark of the beast right there now, but they're also, they have their confederacy. What confederacy? Well, Psalm 83 gives that confederacy. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people. That's David speaking. So David's people are the Jewish people and consulted against thy hidden ones, the hidden ones. Now notice he said thy hidden ones. See, some people, I remember even Chuck Missler asked me this right there at his own office there when we were doing the interview together that many of you see on the beginning of the video here. Chuck asked me the question. He said, Steve, what do you think that is? The hidden ones, the fenecha. He, Chuck was really beginning to lean that that was the, the bride. But at the time, I didn't even know. I have to be honest. I didn't know at that time. But then the Lord revealed to me who the hidden ones were, and I wrote Chuck a letter and let him know. I said, Chuck, I, that's totally wrong on this. I said, that hidden ones are your two witnesses. Notice, consulted against thy hidden ones, David's hidden ones, your hidden ones. They're two Jews. What two Jews are hidden that will come back? Because begin with, if they're going to consult against them, they must be returning. It's going to be a problem for them. And the only two that can be hidden are Moses and Elijah. Now, some believe it's Enoch. Okay, that's fine if that's what you believe. I have no problem with that, all right? But nonetheless, I hold that it's Moses and Elijah because there's too many prophecies about Moses that's never been fulfilled, all right? Even in, what is it, uh, Exodus chapter 32, where God tells Moses he's going to do wonders with him like he's never done in all the time past. And he even warns Moses, don't make any covenants with the people when you come into the land. Now, that's weird because if God's telling Moses, don't make any covenants with those nations when you come in the land, then why in the world did God tell Moses back several chapters before that, I'm not letting you go into the land because of you uh, smiting the rock when I told you to speak to the rock? Now remember, the rock is dealt with two different times in their history. So if God's already said he's not going to go into the land, and now God is telling Moses, you know, when you come to the land that I have given you, don't make any covenants with them. Moses is definitely coming back, friends, all right? So that's the hidden ones. They have said, come let us cut them off from being a nation. Who said that? These people that are confederate with Esau. By the way, in Psalm 83, again, it's about Edom. 
Edom's the one that leads the confederacy here. Again, Esau and Edom. Esau is, of course, uh, the descendants of uh, Esau, which, uh, you know, Israel's uh, son, uh, not Israel, I apologize there. That's um, it, Jacob and Esau were brothers. That's Rebekah and Isaac's son. Uh, there are two sons there, all right? So, uh, and Edom is, he's referred to as Edom in the Bible as well, and also um, um, another, another expression as well. We'll get to that in a moment. Anyway, it says, They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. And that's exactly what they're doing now. As we shared the other day, there was an official website for the United States government, Visa's uh, website, now, it's not the, the uh, uh, US.gov visa. This is an official site that is allowed to do the visa processing for the United States. I posted that link for you. It was in, I believe, uh, United with Israel News or something like one of those places there, but we posted it on that video. And sure enough, when you go to the site for the states that you get to get the visas for, Israel is not mentioned there. Their flag is removed. It's only Jerusalem and Tel Aviv. Why? They're trying to make it where Israel is not going to be a nation anymore. And that the name of Israel may, may, may no more be remembered. Why? They don't want the name of Israel used. The Vatican has always been against Israel's name. They always call it Palestine, Palestine. And they got all their confederacy going along with them, believing the same thing now, trying to wipe out the name of Israel. Psalm 83, 5, for they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. Against who? The Israel. David's people. So the same confederacy here is the same confederacy in Obadiah. All the men of thy confederacy have brought thee even to the border. The men that were at peace with thee have deceived thee and prevailed against thee. They that eat thy bread have laid a wound under thee. There is no un none understanding in him. Now watch what happens if you drop down to verse 10 in Obadiah. For thy violence against thy brother Jacob, shame shall cover thee, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Now Esau, long after his death, his descendants have lived on, they have warred. They became a mighty nation. Even when Moses was coming up, God commanded Moses not to do any evil to, to Esau's descendants. So he'd given them that land. See? So it, has not, it wasn't then, and thou shalt be cut off forever. Not yet. Verse 11, In the day that thou stoodest on the other side, and the day that the strangers carried away captive his forces and foreigners entered into his gates and cast lots upon Jerusalem, even thou wast as one of them. That's pretty strong. So thou was one of them. Remember what Daniel said, that the prince that shall come would be of the people who destroyed the temple and the sanctuary? Daniel 9, around verses, uh, what is that, 25, 26? Exactly. The prince that shall come, that Antichrist, in other words, would be of the people that destroyed the temple and the sanctuary. Titus, the Roman general, everyone knows, was attributed for destroying Jerusalem. But scholars say it wasn't actually Titus that did the main part of the fighting. Yes, it was Roman soldiers there, but the scholars actually declare it was the Assyrians that battled there with him. Well, what do you know? You gotta remember, friends, God does not forget the evils that are done to his people Israel, including the house of Israel. It was Syria that sent the house of Israel into exile, and God is going to recompense Syria for the evils they did to the house of Israel, just as Titus is blamed by the prophet Obadiah for causing as, as a unit, as one with them, as Obadiah says, he accuses the descendants of Esau of doing it and calls it his brother. And we see that Titus was an Edomite in Rome. And by the way, I've done it many times in the past. I can trace the history on it right down to Hadad. Hadad, who was the sole living heir of the children of Edom, escapes to Egypt. He uh, grows up, marries an Egyptian uh, 
girl there and princess there and then goes into Syria, becomes the king of Syria, and later his descendants end up migrating to northern Africa and then right across the water into Italy. So it is true. Now, looking at uh, Joel chapter 3, let's look at something here on this as well. For behold, in those days and at that time, when I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, all right, Jerusalem is the house of Israel, I will also gather all nations and bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. Now that actually has a double meaning right there, the parting of the land. They parted it back years ago, and they're trying to part it again today. They've already parted it again today. When the British mandate came out, they gave Israel back pretty much all the land they would have had before the destruction of, of both House of Israel and the House of, uh, uh, of uh, Judah. But that land has been parted and parted and parted again and again and again. All right? But watch what he says. And they have cast lots for my people and have given a boy for an harlot and sold a girl a wine that, that they might drink. That's what they did to Israel, especially back during the time of uh, the Roman invasion of Titus. All the evil, selling the Jews into slavery and everything else. Yea, and what have you done, done with me, O Tyre and Zidon and the coast of Palestine? Will you render me recompense? And if you recompense me swiftly and speedily, will I return your recompense upon your own head? You see, God's not done. God's going to judge them for what they did. Because you have taken my silver and my gold and carried it into your temples, my goodly pleasant things, the children also of Judah and the children of Jerusalem have you sold into the Grecians that you might remove them far from their border. Behold, I will raise them up out of the place where you have sold them, and I will return your recompense upon your own head, and I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians, to a people afar off, for the Lord hath spoken it. Now here's what gets interesting. I will sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians and to the people afar off. Do you remember when not too long ago, one of the people that, that the ISIS had captured was an Israeli general working? I'm not sorry, not, not uh, ISIS. It was, I believe it was the Kurds captured an Israeli general working for ISIS. Now the ISIS people are the ones that have sold many of their own people, the Syrians, the Kurds. They have sold them as slaves into other countries, including Turkey. And yet we know that the Mossad was involved with ISIS just like the United States was and the CIA. And it's the house of Judah that is in Israel now. So when God says... I will sell your sons and your daughters, he's talking about the Assyrian people, into the hand of the children of Judah, and they shall sell them to the Sabians. God's bringing judgment on this land, friends. He is bringing judgment on Assyria, those surrounding lands, even in this particular... I can show you in Scripture where he specifically names Assyria on the same types of judgments for what they did to the house of Israel when they went into captivity, and that was 700 years before the house of Judah had to go through this. Watch this in Joel 3, that when he speaks of Tyre and Zidon, these are all the, this is like where Lebanon is as well. And the coast of Palestine? Oh my God, friend, this is serious. Now, do you not think God's not going to keep his promise when it concerns Esau and his descendants? Do you not think that the Vatican's not going to fall under judgment by Almighty God? Sure it will. Ezekiel chapter 35, verse 5. Pay attention to this one. Because thou hast had a perpetual hatred and hast shed the blood of the children of Israel by the force of the sword in the time of their calamity, in the time that their iniquity had an end. All right? 
What's the calamity? Obadiah, like I just shared with you a few moments ago. Obadiah, God accuses Esau of being one of them with the Assyrians when they came in and ransacked Jerusalem in 70 AD with the sword. At the time that their, their iniquity had an end, what's going on right now in Israel? The Intifada. What are they using in the Intifada right now? At the time when their iniquity is to have an end. They're using the sword to kill the Jews by the edge of the sword. You don't think that prophecy ain't accurate? In the time that their iniquity had an end. See, they've had a perpetual hatred. And who has incited this violence? The Vatican did. Watch what it says. Guglielmo Miotti and on Israel National News. Uh, uh, December the 15th of 2011, he writes this, there will not be peace if the question of the holy sites is not adequately resolved. Now that was quoted by Cardinal Jean Toron. He said this, the part of Jerusalem within the walls with the holy sites of the three religions is humanity's heritage. The sacred and unique character of the area must be safeguarded and can only be done with a special internationally guaranteed statute. Shimon Perez said they was going to give them the United Nations there to do that. That's what he's calling for. Let me tell you something. The Pope of Rome is still calling the shots. He is Esau's descendants, and he's a true Italian. That's the funny thing. Pope Francis is an Italian. And some people say, well, it's supposed to be an Arabic Antichrist. Well, do you not know that the children of Esau have always married in amongst the Arabic people their entire life? Why do you think Italians favor in looks that of the Arabic peoples? And yes, they are brothers to the Jews as well. They are, you know, half brothers to the Jews. But Esau always mingled with the Arabs, just like the Vatican also mingles with the Arabs to this day. Let's move on. We're getting right here near the end now. Ezekiel 35, verses 5 to 10. Watch what else it says. Because thou has had a perpetual hatred and has shed the blood of the children of Israel by force of the sword in the time of their calamity and the time that their iniquity had an end. Therefore, as I live, saith the Lord God, I will prepare thee unto blood and blood shall pursue thee. Sit thou hast not hated blood, even blood shall pursue thee. Thus will I make Mount Seir most desolate. Mount Seir, by the way, is the mountain in which Esau was given by God. All right. Nowadays, in modern times, that mountain is Italy. It is Rome itself. And cut off from it him that passeth out and him that returneth. That's because every world dignitary goes in and out of the Papacy's uh, Vatican City right there. By the way, this is all up there coming off the mountains of Italy, too. I, I didn't realize that until I actually drove down there. I didn't realize this was nothing but a big, huge chain of mountains in, Israel, in Italy. Uh, anyway, it goes on to say, And I will fill his mountains with his slain men, in thy hills and in thy valleys, and all thy rivers shall they fall that are slain with the sword. I will make thee perpetual desolations, and thy city shall not return, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Because thou hast said, these two nations, these two countries shall be mine and we will possess it, whereas the Lord was there. And they still think they're going to possess all of Israel, including the West Bank. That's why they're splitting the land into two nations, so the prophecy can be fulfilled. Now, watch what we see in Obadiah. Let's drop down to first, uh, verse uh, 15 in Ezekiel 35. Now, I kind of threw this title up myself, Be Not Deceived, God is Not Mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Galatians 6, 7. As thou did rejoice at the inheritance of the house of Israel. Again, Edom is being blamed for the destruction of the house of Israel. Uh, or excuse me, in this case here, he said he rejoiced. I apologize. They're, they're, they're guilty of the destruction of the house of Judah. Let me back up. As thou didst rejoice at the, at, uh, at the inheritance of the house of Israel, because it was desolate, so will I do unto thee. Thou shalt be desolate, O Mount Seir, and all at Amia, even all of it, and they shall know that I am the Lord. See? Now, 
He didn't say he was involved in the dispersion of the house of Israel, but it said he rejoiced over it. Watch what it says in Obadiah. But thou shouldst not have looked on the day of thy brother in the day that he became a stranger. Neither shouldst thou have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. Esau has always taken a great pleasure in the calamity that strikes Israel. Neither shouldst thou have spoken proudly in the day of their distress. Judgment is coming to Rome, just as we see judgment is being fulfilled in the land of Syria and western Iraq. It's going to be fulfilled as well in the very near future with Rome. And by the way, when God said he will destroy them when all the earth rejoices, that just so happens at the death of the two witnesses. When those two witnesses have been killed, the Bible says the earth will rejoice. That time's not far away. I'm Stephen Benoon with Straight News Live. Shalom.